The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham Chapter 5 Dulce Domum The sheep ran huddling together against the hurdles, blowing out thin nostrils and stamping with delicate forefeet, their heads thrown back, and a light steam rising from the crowded sheep pen into the frosty air as the two animals hastened by in high spirits, with much chatter and laughter. They were returning across country after a long day's outing with Otter, hunting and exploring on the wide uplands where certain streams tributary to their own river had their first small beginnings, and the shades of the short winter day were closing in on them, and they still had some distance to go. Plodding at random across the plough, they had heard the sheep and had made for them, and now, leading from the sheep pen, they found a beaten track that made walking a lighter business, and responded moreover to that small inquiring something which all animals carry inside them, saying unmistakably, Yes, quite right, this leads home. It looks as if we were coming to a village, said the mole, somewhat dubiously slackening his pace, as the track that had in time become a path, and then had developed into a lane, now handed them over to the charge of a well-metalled road. The animals did not hold with villagers, and their own highways, thickly frequented as they were, took an independent course, regardless of church, post-office, or public-house. "'Oh, never mind,' said the Rat. At this season of the year they are all safe indoors by this time, sitting around the fire. Men, women, and children, dogs and cats and all. We shall slip through all right, without any bother or unpleasantness. And we can have a look at them through their windows, if you like, and see what they're doing. The rapid nightfall of midwinter had quite beset the little village as they approached it on soft feet, over a first thin fall of powdery snow. Little was visible but squares of a dusky orange-red on either side of the street, where the firelight or lamplight of each cottage overflowed through the casements into the dark world without. Most of the low-latticed windows were innocent of blinds, and to the lookers-in from outside the inmates gathered round the tea-table, absorbed in handiwork, or talking with laughter and gesture, had each that happy grace which is the last thing the skilled actor shall capture the natural grace which goes with perfect unconsciousness of observation. Moving at will from one theatre to another, the two spectators, so far from home themselves, had something of wistfulness in their eyes as they watched a cat being stroked, a sleepy child picked up and huddled off to bed, or a tired man stretch and knock out his pipe on the end of a smouldering log. But it was from one little window, with its blind drawn down, a mere blank transparency on the night, that the sense of home, and the little curtained world within walls, the larger stressful world of outside nature, shut out and forgotten, most pulsated. Close against the white blind hung a bird cage, clearly silhouetted, every wire, perch, and appurtenance, distinct and recognizable, even to yesterday's dull-edged lump of sugar, on the middle perch the fluffy occupant, head tucked well into feathers, seemed so near to them as to be easily stroked, had they tried. Even the delicate tips of his plumped-out plumage pencilled plainly on the illuminated screen. As they looked, the sleepy little fellow stirred uneasily, woke, shook himself, and raised his head. They could see the gape of his tiny beak as he yawned in a bored sort of way, looked round, and then settled his head into his back again, while the ruffled feathers gradually subsided into perfect stillness. Then a gust of bitter wind took them in the back of the neck, a small sting of frozen sleet on the skin woke them as from a dream, and they knew their toes to be cold, and their legs tired, and their own home distant a weary way. Once beyond the village, where the cottages ceased abruptly, on either side of the road they could smell through the darkness the friendly fields again, 
and they braced themselves for the last long stretch, the home stretch, the stretch that we know is bound to end some time in the rattle of the door latch, the sudden firelight, and the sight of familiar things greeting us as long absent travellers from far over sea. They plodded along steadily and silently, each of them thinking his own thoughts. The moles ran a good deal on supper, as it was pitch dark, and it was all a strange country for him, as far as he knew, and he was following obediently in the wake of the rat, leaving the guidance entirely to him. As for the rat, he was walking a little way ahead, as his habit was, his shoulders humped, his eyes fixed on the straight grey road in front of him, so he did not notice poor Mole when suddenly the summons reached him, and took him like an electric shock. We others, who have long lost the more subtle of the physical senses, have not even proper terms to express an animal's intercommunications with his surroundings, living or otherwise and have only the word smell, for instance, to include the whole range of delicate thrills which murmur in the nose of the animal night and day, summoning, warning, inciting, repelling. It was one of these mysterious fairy calls from out of the void that suddenly reached Mole in the darkness, making him tingle through and through with its very familiar appeal even while yet he could not clearly remember what it was. He stopped dead in his tracks, his nose searching hither and thither in its efforts to recapture the fine filament, the telegraphic current that had so strongly moved him. A moment, and he had caught it again, and with it this time came recollection in fullest flood. Home! That was what they meant, those caressing appeals, those soft touches wafted through the air, those invisible little hands pulling and tugging all one way. Why, it must be quite close by him at that moment, his old home that he had hurriedly forsaken and never sought again, that day when he first found the river. And now it was sending out its scouts and its messengers to capture him and bring him in, since his escape on that bright morning he had hardly given it a thought, so absorbed had he been in his new life, in all its pleasures, its surprises, its fresh and captivating experiences. Now, with a rush of old memories, how clearly it stood up before him in the darkness, shabby indeed, and small, and poorly furnished, and yet his, the home he had made for himself the home he had been so happy to get back to after his day's work. And the home had been happy with him too, evidently, and was missing him, and wanted him back, and was telling him so through his nose, sorrowfully, reproachfully, but with no bitterness or anger, only with plaintive reminder that it was there and wanted him. The call was clear, the summons was plain. He must obey it instantly and go, Ratty, he called, full of joyful excitement. Hold on, come back, I want you quick. Oh, come along, Mole, do, replied the Rat cheerfully, still plodding along. Please stop, Ratty, pleaded the poor Mole, in anguish of heart. You don't understand, it's my home, my old home. I've just come across the smell of it, and it's close by here, really quite close, and I must go to it. I must, I must. Oh, come back, Ratty. Please, please come back. The Rat was by this time very far ahead, too far to hear clearly what the Mole was calling, too far to catch the sharp note of painful appeal in his voice. And he was much taken up with the weather, for he too could smell something, something suspiciously like approaching snow. "'Mole, we mustn't stop now, really,' he called back. "'We'll come for it to-morrow, whatever it is you've found. "'But I daren't stop now. It's late, and the snow's coming on again, and I'm not sure of the way. "'And I want your nose, Mole, so come on quick, there's a good fellow.' And the rat pressed forward on his way, 
without waiting for an answer. Poor Mole stood alone in the road, his heart torn asunder, and a big sob gathering, gathering, somewhere low down inside him, to leap up to the surface presently, he knew, in passionate escape. But even under such a test as this, his loyalty to his friend stood firm. Never for a moment did he dream of abandoning him. Meanwhile the wafts from his old home pleaded, whispered, conjured, and finally claimed him imperiously. He dared not tarry longer within their magic circle. With a wrench that tore his very heart-strings, he set his face down the road, and followed submissively in the track of the rat, while faint, thin little smells, still dogging his retreating nose, reproached him for his new friendship and his callous forgetfulness. With an effort he caught up to the unsuspecting rat, who began chattering cheerfully about what they would do when they got back, and how jolly a fire of logs in the parlour would be, and what a supper he meant to eat, never noticing his companion's silence and distressful state of mind. At last, however, when they had gone some considerable way further, and were passing some tree stumps at the edge of a copse that bordered the road, he stopped and said kindly, "'Look here, mole old chap, you seem dead tired. No talk left in you, and your feet dragging like lead. We'll sit down here for a minute and rest. The snow has held off so far, and the best part of our journey is over.' The mole subsided forlornly on a tree stump, and tried to control himself, for he felt it surely coming. The sob he had fought with so long refused to be beaten. Up and up it forced its way to the air, and then another, and another, and others thickened fast, till poor mole at last gave up the struggle, and cried freely and helplessly and openly, now that he knew it was all over and he had lost what he could hardly be said to have found. The rat, astonished and dismayed at the violence of Mole's paroxysm of grief, did not dare to speak for a while. At last he said, very quietly and sympathetically, "'What is it, old fellow? Whatever can be the matter? Tell us your trouble, and let me see what I can do.' Poor Mole found it difficult to get any words out between the upheavals of his chest that followed one another so quickly, and held back speech, and choked it as it came. "'I know it's a shabby, dingy little place,' he sobbed forth at last, brokenly. "'Not like your cosy quarters, or, or Toad's beautiful hall, or Badger's great house. But it was my own little home.' and I was fond of it, and I went away and forgot all about it, and then I smelt it suddenly on the road, when I called and you wouldn't listen, Rat, and everything came back to me with a rush, and I wanted it, oh dear, oh dear, and when you wouldn't turn back, Ratty, and I, I had to leave it, Though I was smelling it all the time, I thought my heart would break. We might have just gone and had one look at it, Ratty. Only one look. It was close by. But you wouldn't turn back, Ratty. You wouldn't turn back. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Recollection brought fresh waves of sorrow, and sobs again took full charge of him preventing further speech. The rat stared straight in front of him, saying nothing, only patting Mole gently on the shoulder. After a time he muttered gloomily, I see it all now. What a pig I have been! A pig, that's me! Just a pig, a plain pig! He waited till Mole's sobs became gradually less stormy and more rhythmical. He waited till at last sniffs were frequent, and sobs only intermittent. Then he rose from his seat, and remarking carelessly, Well, now we'd really better be getting on, old chap, set off up the road again, over the toilsome way they had come. Where are you going to, ratty? cried the tearful mole, 
looking up in alarm. "'We're going to find that home of yours, old fellow,' replied the Rat pleasantly. "'So you had better come along, for it will take some finding, and we shall want your nose.' "'Oh, come back, Ratty, do,' cried the Mole, getting up and hurrying after him. "'It's no good, I tell you. It's too late and too dark, and the place is too far off, and the snow's coming, and—' "'And I never meant to let you know I was feeling that way about it. "'It was all an accident and a mistake. "'And think of Riverbank and your supper.' "'Hang Riverbank, and supper too,' said the Rat heartily. "'I tell you, I'm going to find this place now if I stay out all night. "'So cheer up, old chap, and take my arm, and we'll very soon be back there again.' "'Still snuffling, pleading, and reluctant, "'Mole suffered himself to be dragged back along the road by his imperious companion.' who, by a flow of cheerful talk and anecdote, endeavoured to beguile his spirits back, and make the weary way seem shorter. When at last it seemed to the Rat that they must be nearing that part of the road where the Mole had been held up, he said, Now, no more talking. Business. Use your nose, and give your mind to it. They moved on in silence for some little way, when suddenly— the Rat was conscious, through his arm that was linked in moles, of a faint sort of electric thrill that was passing down that animal's body. Instantly he disengaged himself, fell back a pace, and waited, all attention. The signals were coming through. Mole stood a moment, rigid, while his uplifted nose, quivering slightly, felt the air. Then a short quick run forward, a fault, a check, a try back, and then a slow, steady, confident advance. The Rat, much excited, kept close to his heels, as the Mole, with something of the air of a sleepwalker, crossed a dry ditch, scrambled through a hedge, and nosed his way over a field, open and trackless and bare in the faint starlight. Suddenly, without giving warning, he dived, but the Rat was on the alert, and promptly followed him down the tunnel, to which his unerring nose had faithfully led him. It was close and airless, and the earthy smell was strong, and it seemed a long time to Rat ere the passage ended and he could stand erect and stretch and shake himself. The Mole struck a match, and by its light the Rat saw that they were standing in an open space, neatly swept and sanded underfoot, and directly facing them was Mole's little front door, with Mole End painted in Gothic lettering over the bell-pull at the side. Mole reached down a lantern from a nail on the wall, and lit it, and the Rat, looking round him, saw that they were in a sort of forecourt. A garden seat stood on one side of the door, and on the other a roller, for the Mole, who was a tidy animal when at home, could not stand having his ground kicked up by other animals into little runs that ended in earth heaps. On the walls hung wire baskets with ferns in them, alternating with brackets carrying plaster statuary, Garibaldi, and the infant Samuel, and Queen Victoria, and other heroes of modern Italy. Down on one side of the forecourt ran a skittle alley, with benches along it, and little wooden tables marked with rings that hinted at beer-mugs. In the middle was a small round pond, containing goldfish, and surrounded by a cockle-shell border. Out of the centre of the pond rose a fanciful erection, clothed in more cockle-shells, and topped by a large silvered glass ball that reflected everything all wrong, and had a very pleasing effect. Mole's face beamed at the sight of all these objects so dear to him, and he hurried Rat through the door, lit a lamp in the hall, and took one glance around his old home. He saw the dust lying thick on everything, saw the cheerless, deserted look of the long-neglected house, and its narrow, meagre dimensions, its warm and shabby contents, and collapsed again on a hall chair, his nose to his paws. "'Oh, Ratty!' he cried dismally. "'Why ever did I do it? Why did I bring you to this poor, cold little place on a night like this, when you might have been at Riverbank by this time? 
toasting your toes before a blazing fire, with all your nice things about you. The rat paid no heed to his doleful self-reproaches. He was running here and there, opening doors, inspecting rooms and cupboards, and lighting lamps and candles and sticking them up everywhere. "'What a capital little house this is!' he called out cheerily. "'So compact! So well planned! Everything here! And everything in its place! We'll make a jolly night of it! The first thing we want is a good fire. I'll see to that. I always know where to find things. So this is the parlour. Splendid! Your own idea, those little sleeping bunks in the wall? Capital! Now, I'll fetch the wood and the coals, and you get a duster, Mole. You'll find one in the drawer of the kitchen table, and try and smarten things up a bit. Bustle about, old chap. Encouraged by his inspiriting companion, the Mole roused himself, and dusted and polished with energy and heartiness, while the Rat, running to and fro with armfuls of fuel, soon had a cheerful blaze roaring up the chimney. He hailed the Mole to come and warm himself, but Mole promptly had another fit of the blues, dropping down on a couch in dark despair, and burying his face in his duster. Rat, he moaned, how about your supper, you poor, cold, hungry, weary animal? I've nothing to give you, nothing, not a crumb. What a fellow you are for giving in, said the Rat reproachfully. Why, only just now I saw a sardine opener on the kitchen dresser. "'Quite distinctly, and everybody knows that means there are sardines about somewhere in the neighbourhood. "'Rouse yourself, pull yourself together, and come with me, and forage.' "'They went and foraged accordingly, hunting through every cupboard and turning out every drawer. "'The result was not so very depressing, after all, though of course it might have been better. "'A tin of sardines, a box of captain's biscuits, nearly full, and a German sausage encased in silver paper.' "'There's a banquet for you,' observed the Rat, as he arranged the table. "'I know some animals who would give their ears to be sitting down to supper with us to-night.' "'No bread?' groaned the Mole dolorously. "'No butter? No—' "'No pâté de foie gras? No champagne?' continued the Rat, grinning. "'And that reminds me. What's that little door at the end of the passage?' "'Your cellar, of course. Every luxury in this house. Just you wait a minute.' He made for the cellar door, and presently reappeared somewhat dusty, with a bottle of beer in each paw, and another under each arm. "'Self-indulgent little beggar you seem to be, Mole,' he observed. "'Deny yourself nothing. This is really the jolliest little place I ever was in. Now wherever did you pick up those prints? Make the place look so homelike they do. No wonder you're so fond of it, Mole. Tell us all about it, and how you came to make it what it is.' Then, while the Rat busied himself fetching plates, and knives and forks, and mustard which he mixed in an egg-cup. The Mole, his bosom still heaving with the stress of his recent emotion, related, somewhat shyly at first, but with more freedom as he warmed to his subject, how this was planned, and how that was thought out, and how this was got through a windfall from an aunt, and that was a wonderful find and a bargain, and this other thing was brought out of laborious savings, and a certain amount of going without. His spirits finally quite restored, he must needs go and caress his possessions, and take a lamp, and show off their points to his visitor, and expatiate on them, quite forgetful of the supper they both so much needed. Rat, who was desperately hungry but strove to conceal it, nodding seriously, examining with a puckered brow, and saying, Wonderful! and most remarkable! at intervals, when the chance for an observation was given him. At last the Rat succeeded in decoying him to the table, and had just got seriously to work with the sardine-opener, when sounds were heard from the forecourt without, sounds like the scuffling of small feet in the gravel, and a confused murmur of tiny voices, while broken sentences reached them. "'Now, all in a line. Hold the lantern up a bit, Tommy. Clear your throats first. No coughing after I say one, two, three. Where's young Bill?' "'Here, come on, do. We're all awaiting. "'What's up?' inquired the Rat, pausing in his labours. "'I think it must be the field mice,' replied the Mole, with a touch of pride in his manner. "'They go around carol-singing regularly at this time of year. "'They're quite an institution in these parts, and they never pass me over. "'They come to Mole End last of all, and I used to give them hot drinks, "'and supper too, sometimes, when I could afford it. 
It will be like old times to hear them again. Let's have a look at them, cried the rat, jumping up and running to the door. It was a pretty sight and a seasonable one that met their eyes when they flung the door open. In the forecourt, lit by the dim rays of a horn lantern, some eight or ten little field mice stood in a semicircle, red worsted comforters round their throats, their forepaws thrust deep into their pockets, their feet jigging for warmth. With bright beady eyes they glanced shyly at each other, sniggering a little, sniffing and applying coat-sleeves a good deal. As the door opened, one of the elder ones that carried the lantern was just saying, Now then, one, two, three, and forthwith their shrill little voices uprose on the air, singing one of the old-time carols that their forefathers composed in fields that were fallow and held by frost, or when snowbound in chimney-corners, and handed down to be sung in the miry street to lamp-lit windows at Yule-time. Villagers all this frosty tide, let your doors swing open wide, Though wind may follow, and snow beside, Yet draw us in by your fire to bide, Joy shall be yours in the morning. Here we stand, in the cold and the sleet, Blowing fingers and stamping feet, Come from far away you to greet, You by the fire, and we in the street, Bidding you joy in the morning. For ere one half of the night was gone, Sudden a star has led us on, Raining bliss and benison, Bliss to-morrow, and more anon, Joy for every morning. Goodman Joseph toiled through the snow, Saw the star o'er a stable low, Mary she might not further go, Welcome thatch and litter below, Joy was hers in the morning. And then, they heard the angels tell who were the first to cry Noel, animals all, as it befell, in the stable where they did dwell. Joy shall be theirs in the morning. The voices ceased, the singers, bashful but smiling, exchanged sidelong glances, and silence succeeded, but for a moment only. Then, from up above and far away, down the tunnel they had so lately travelled, was borne to their ears, in a faint musical hum, the sound of distant bells, ringing a joyful and clangorous peal. "'Very well sung, boys,' cried the Rat heartily. "'And now come along in, all of you, and warm yourself by the fire, and have something hot.' "'Yes, come along, field mice,' cried the Mole eagerly. "'This is quite like old times.' Shut the door after you. Pull up that settle to the fire. Now you just wait a minute while we— Oh, Ratty! He cried in despair, plumping down on a seat, with tears impending. Whatever are we doing? We've nothing to give them. You leave all that to me," said the masterful Rat. Here, you with the lantern, come over this way. I want to talk to you. Now tell me, are there any shops open at this hour of the night? Why, certainly, sir. So replied the field mouse respectfully. At this time of year our shops keep open to all sorts of hours. Then look here, said the rat. You go off at once, you and your lantern, and you get me your... Here much muttered conversation ensued, and the mole only heard bits of it, such as, Fresh mind. No, a pound of that'll do. See you get Bugginses, for I won't have any other. No, only the best. If you can't get it there, try somewhere else. Yes, of course, homemade, no tin stuff. Well, then, do the best you can. Finally, there was a chink of coin passing from paw to paw. The field mouse was provided with an ample basket for his purchases, and off he hurried, he and his lantern. The rest of the field mice, perched in a row on the settle, their small legs swinging, gave themselves up to enjoyment of the fire, and toasted their chilblains till they tingled while the Mole, failing to draw them into easy conversation, plunged into family history, and made each of them recite the names of his numerous brothers, who were too young, it appeared, to be allowed to go out a caroling this year, but looked forward very shortly to winning the parental consent. The Rat, meanwhile,
was busy examining the label on one of the beer bottles. "'I perceive this to be old Burton,' he remarked approvingly. "'Sensible mole! The very thing! Now we shall be able to mull some ale. Get the things ready, mole, while I draw the corks.' It did not take long to prepare the brew, and thrust the tin heater well into the red heart of the fire, and soon every field mouse was sipping and coughing and choking, for a little mulled ale goes a long way, and wiping his eyes and laughing and forgetting he had ever been cold in all his life. "'They act plays, too, these fellows,' the mole explained to the rat. "'Make them all up by themselves, and act them afterwards, and very well they do it, too.' They gave us a capital one last year, about a, a field mouse who was captured at sea by a Barbary corsair, and made to row in a galley, and when he escaped and got home again, his lady-love had gone into a convent. Here, you, you were in it, I remember. Get up and recite a bit. The field mouse addressed, got up on his legs, giggled slightly, looked round the room, and remained absolutely tongue-tied. His comrades cheered him on. Mole coaxed and encouraged him, and the rat went so far as to take him by the shoulders and shake him, but nothing could overcome his stage fright. They were all busily engaged on him, like watermen applying the Royal Humane Society's regulations to a case of long submersion, when the latch clicked, the door opened, and the field mouse with the lantern reappeared, staggering under the weight of his basket. There was no more talk of play-acting once the very real and solid contents of the basket had been tumbled out on the table. Under the generalship of Rat, everybody was set to do something, or to fetch something. In a very few minutes supper was ready, and Mole, as he took the head of the table, in a sort of a dream, saw a lately barren board, set thick with savoury comforts, saw his little friends' faces brighten and beam, as they fell to, without delay, and then let himself loose, for he was famished indeed, on the provender so magically provided, thinking what a happy homecoming this had turned out after all. As they ate, they talked of old times, and the field mice gave him the local gossip up to date, and answered as well as they could the hundred questions he had to ask them. The rat said little or nothing, only taking care that each guest had what he wanted, and plenty of it, and that Mole had no trouble or anxiety about anything. They clattered off at last, very grateful, and showering wishes of the season, with their jacket pockets stuffed with remembrances for the small brothers and sisters at home. When the door had closed on the last of them, and the chink of the lanterns had died away, Mole and Rat kicked the fire up, drew their chairs in, brewed themselves a last nightcap of mulled ale, and discussed the events of the long day. At last the Rat, with a tremendous yawn, said, "'Mole, old chap, I'm ready to drop. Sleepy is simply not the word. That your own bunk over on that side? Very well, then. I'll take this. What a ripping little house this is! Everything's so handy!' He clambered into his bunk, and rolled himself well up in the blankets, and slumber gathered him forthwith, as a swathe of barley is folded into the arms of the reaping machine. The weary mole also was glad to turn in without delay, and soon had his head on his pillow, in great joy and contentment. But ere he closed his eyes, he let them wander round his old room, mellow in the glow of the firelight that played or rested on familiar and friendly things, which had long been unconsciously a part of him, and now smilingly received him back without rancour. He was now in just the frame of mind that the tactful rat had quietly worked to bring about in him. He saw clearly how plain and simple, how narrow even, it all was, but clearly, too, how much it all meant to him, and the special value of some such anchorage in one's existence. He did not at all want to abandon the new life and its splendid spaces, 
to turn his back on sun and air and all they offered him, and creep home and stay there. The upper world was all too strong. It called to him still, even down there, and he knew he must return to the larger stage. But it was good to think that he had this to come back to, this place which was all his own, these things which were so glad to see him again, and could always be counted upon for the same simple welcome. End of chapter 5「The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham Chapter 6 Mr. Toad It was a bright morning in the early part of summer. The river had resumed its wanted banks and its accustomed pace, and a hot sun seemed to be pulling everything green and bushy and spiky up out of the earth towards him, as if by strings. The mole and the water rat had been up since dawn, very busy on matters connected with boats and the opening of the boating season, painting and varnishing, mending paddles, repairing cushions, hunting for missing boat hooks, and so on, and were finishing breakfast in their little parlor and eagerly discussing their plans for the day when a heavy knock sounded at the door. Bother, said the rat all over Egg. See how it is, Mole, lock a good chap, since you've finished. The Mole went to attend the summons, and the rat heard him utter a cry of surprise. Then he flung the parlor door open and announced with much importance, Mr. Badger. This was a wonderful thing indeed, that the Badger should pay a formal call on them, or indeed on anybody. He generally had to be caught, if you wanted him badly, as he slipped quietly along a hedgerow of an early morning or a late evening, or else hunted up in his own house in the middle of the wood, which was a serious undertaking. The badger strode heavily into the room and stood looking at the two animals with an expression full of seriousness. The rat let his egg spoon fall on the tablecloth and sat open-mouthed. "'The hour has come,' said the badger at last with great solemnity. "'What hour?' asked the rat uneasily, glancing at the clock on the mantelpiece. "'Whose hour, you should rather say,' replied the badger. "'Why, Toad's hour. The hour of Toad. "'I said I would take him in hand as soon as the winter was well over, "'and I'm going to take him in hand today.' "'Toad's hour, of course,' cried the mole delightedly. "'Hooray! I remember now. We'll teach him to be a sensible Toad.' "'This very morning,' continued the badger, taking an armchair, as I learned last night from a trustworthy source, another new and exceptionally powerful motor car will arrive at Toad Hall on approval or return. At this very moment, perhaps, Toad is busy arraying himself in those singularly hideous habiliments so dear to him, which transform him from a comparatively good-looking Toad into an object which throws any decent-minded animal that comes across it into a violent fit. We must be up and doing, ere it is too late. You two animals will accompany me instantly to Toad Hall, and the work of rescue shall be accomplished. Right you are, cried the rat, starting up. We'll rescue the poor run at me animal. We'll convert him. He'll be the most converted Toad that ever was before we've done with him. They set off up the road on their mission of mercy, Badger leading the way. Animals when in company walk in a proper and sensible manner, in single file, instead of sprawling all across the road and being of no use or support to each other in case of sudden trouble or danger. They reached the carriage drive of Toad Hall to find, as the badger had anticipated, a shiny new motor car of great size, painted a bright red, Toad's favorite color, standing in front of the house. As they neared the door, it was flung open, and Mr. Toad, arrayed in goggles, cap, gaiters, and enormous overcoat, came swaggering down the steps, drawing on his gauntleted gloves. Hello! Come on, you fellows! he cried cheerfully on catching sight of them. You're just in time to come with me for a jolly... Uh, to come for a jolly... for a... Uh, jolly... His hearty accents faltered and fell away as he noticed the stern, unbending look on the countenances of his silent friends, and his invitation remained unfinished. The badger strode up the steps. "'Take him inside,' he said sternly to his companions. Then, as Toad was hustled through the door, struggling and protesting, he turned to the chauffeur in charge of the new motor car. 
I'm afraid you won't be wanted today, he said. Mr. Toad has changed his mind. He will not require the car. Please understand that this is final. You needn't wait. Then he followed the others inside and shut the door. Now then, he said to the toad when the four of them stood together in the hall, first of all, take those ridiculous things off. Shan't, replied the toad with great spirit. What is the meaning of this gross outrage? I demand an instant explanation. Take them off him then, you two, ordered the badger briefly. They had to lay Toad out on the floor, kicking and calling all sorts of names, before they could get to work properly. Then the rat sat on him, and the mole got his motor clothes off him bit by bit, and they stood him up on his legs again. A good deal of his blustering spirit seemed to have evaporated with the removal of his fine panoply. Now that he was merely Toad, and no longer the terror of the highway, he giggled feebly and looked from one to the other appealingly, seeming quite to understand the situation. You knew it must come to this sooner or later, Toad, the badger explained severely. You've disregarded all the warnings we've given you. You've gone on squandering the money your father left you, and you're getting us animals a bad name in the district by your furious driving and your smashes and your rows with the police. Independence is all very well, but we animals never allow our friends to make fools of themselves beyond a certain limit, and that limit you've reached. Now, you're a good fellow in many respects, and I don't want to be too hard on you. I'll make one more effort to bring you to reason. You will come with me into the smoking room, and there you will hear some facts about yourself, and we'll see whether you come out of that room the same toad that you went in. He took Toad firmly by the arm, led him into the smoking room, and closed the door behind them. That's no good, said the rat contemptuously. Talking a towel'll never cure him. He'll say anything. They made themselves comfortable in armchairs and waited patiently. Through the closed door they could just hear the long, continuous drone of the badger's voice, rising and falling in waves of oratory, and presently they noticed that the sermon began to be punctuated at intervals by long-drawn sobs, evidently proceeding from the bosom of Toad, who was a soft-hearted and affectionate fellow, very easily converted, for the time being, to any point of view. After some three-quarters of an hour, the door opened, and the badger reappeared, solemnly leading by the paw a very limp and dejected toad. His skin hung baggily about him, his legs wobbled, and his cheeks were furrowed by the tears so plentifully called forth by the badger's moving discourse. "'Sit down there, toad,' said the badger kindly, pointing to a chair. "'My friends,' he went on, I am pleased to inform you that Toad has at last seen the error of his ways. He is truly sorry for his misguided conduct in the past, and he has undertaken to give up motor cars entirely and forever. I have his solemn promise to that effect. That is very good news, said the Mole gravely. Very good news indeed, observed the Rat dubiously. If only, if only... He was looking very hard at Toad as he said this, and could not help thinking he perceived something vaguely resembling a twinkle in that animal's still sorrowful eye. "'There's only one thing more to be done,' continued the gratified badger. "'Toad, I want you solemnly to repeat, before your friends here, what you fully admitted to me in the smoking-room just now. First, you are sorry for what you've done, and you see the folly of it all.' There was a long, long pause. Toad looked desperately this way and that, while the other animals waited in grave silence. At last he spoke. No, he said a little sullenly, but stoutly. I'm not sorry, and it wasn't folly at all. It was simply glorious. What? cried the badger, greatly scandalized. You backsliding animal! Didn't you tell me just now in there? Oh, yes, 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 in there, said Toad impatiently. I'd have said anything in there. You're so eloquent, dear Badger, and so moving and so convincing, and put all your points so frightfully well. You can do what you like with me in there, and you know it. But I've been searching my mind since, and going over things in it, and I find that I'm not a bit sorry or repentant, really. So it's no earthly good saying I am, now is it? Then you don't promise, said the Badger, never to touch a motor car again? Certainly not, replied Toad emphatically. On the contrary, I faithfully promise that the very first motor car I see, poop-poop, off I go in it. 
"'Told you so, didn't I?' observed the rat to the mole. "'Very well, then,' said the badger firmly, rising to his feet. "'Since you won't yield to persuasion, we'll try what force can do. "'I feared it would come to this all along. "'You've often asked us three to come and stay with you, Toad, in this handsome house of yours. "'Well, now we're going to. "'When we've converted you to a proper point of view, we may quit, but not before. "'Take him upstairs, you two, and lock him up in his bedroom, while we arrange matters between ourselves.' "'It's for your own good, Toady, you know,' said the rat kindly, as Toad, kicking and struggling, was hauled up the stairs by his two faithful friends. "'Think what fun we shall all have together, just as we're used to, when you've quite got over this... this painful attack of yours.' "'We'll take great care of everything for you till you're well, Toad,' said the mole, "'and we'll see your money isn't wasted, as it has been.' "'No more of those regrettable incidents with the police, Toad,' said the rat, as they thrust him into his bedroom." "'And no more weeks in hospital, being ordered about by female nurses, Toad,' added the mole, turning the key on him. They descended the stair, Toad shouting abuse at them through the keyhole, and the three friends then met in conference on the situation. "'It's going to be a tedious business,' said the badger, sighing. "'I've never seen Toad so determined. However, we will see it out. He must never be left an instant unguarded.' We shall have to take it in turns to be with him, till the poison has worked itself out of his system. They arranged watches accordingly. Each animal took it in turns to sleep in Toad's room at night, and they divided the day up between them. At first Toad was undoubtedly very trying to his careful guardians. When his violent paroxysms possessed him, he would arrange bedroom chairs in rude resemblance of a motor car, and would crouch on the foremost of them, bent forward and staring fixedly ahead, making uncouth and ghastly noises, till the climax was reached when, turning a complete somersault, he would lie prostrate amidst the ruins of the chairs, apparently completely satisfied for the moment. As time passed, however, these painful seizures grew gradually less frequent, and his friends strove to divert his mind into fresh channels. But his interest in other matters did not seem to revive, and he grew apparently languid and depressed. One fine morning the rat, whose turn it was to go on duty, went upstairs to relieve Badger, whom he found fidgeting to be off and stretch his legs in a long ramble round his wood and down his earths and burrows. "'Toad's still in bed,' he told the rat outside the door. "'Can't get much out of him except, oh, leave him alone, he wants nothing. Perhaps he'll be better presently, it may pass off in time, don't be unduly anxious, and so on. "'Now you look out, rat!' When Toad's quiet and submissive and playing at being the hero of a Sunday school prize, that's when he's at his artfulest. There's sure to be something up. I know him. Well, now I must be off. How are you today, old chap? inquired the rat cheerfully as he approached Toad's bedside. He had to wait some minutes for an answer. At last a feeble voice replied, Thank you so much, dear ratty. So good of you to inquire. "'But first tell me how you are yourself, and the excellent Mole.' "'Oh, we're all right,' replied the Rat. "'Mole,' he added incautiously, "'is going out for a run round with Badger. "'They'll be out all till luncheon time, "'so you and I will spend a pleasant morning together, "'and I'll do my best to amuse you. "'Now jump up, there's a good fellow, "'and don't lie moping there on a fine morning like this.' "'Dear, kind Rat,' murmured Toad, how little you realize my condition, and how very far I am from jumping up now, if ever. But do not trouble about me. I hate being a burden to my friends, and I do not expect to be one much longer. Indeed, I almost hope not. Well, I hope not, too, said the rat heartily. You've been a fine bother to us all this time, and I'm glad to hear it's going to stop. "'And in weather like this, and the boating season just beginning. "'It's too bad of you, Toad. "'It isn't the trouble we mind, but you're making us miss such an awful lot.' "'I'm afraid it is the trouble you mind, though,' replied the Toad languidly. "'I can quite understand it. "'It's natural enough. "'You're tired of bothering about me. "'I mustn't ask you to do anything further. "'I'm a nuisance, I know.' "'You are indeed,' said the Rat. "'But I tell you, 
I'd take any travel on earth for you, if only you'd be a sensible animal. If I thought that, Ratty, murmured Toad, more feebly than ever, then I would beg you, for the last time, probably, to step round to the village as quickly as possible. Even now it may be too late, and fetch the doctor. But don't you bother. It's only trouble, and perhaps we may as well let things take their course. Why, what do you want a doctor for? inquired the rat, coming closer and examining him. He certainly lay very still and flat, and his voice was weaker and his manner much changed. Surely you have noticed of late, murmured Toad. But no, why should you? Noticing things is only a trouble. Tomorrow, indeed, you may be saying to yourself, Oh, if only I had noticed sooner. If only I had done something. But no, it's a trouble. Never mind. Forget that I asked. Look here, old man, said the rat, beginning to get rather alarmed. Of course I'll fetch a doctor for you, if you really think you want him. But you can hardly be bad enough for that yet. Let's talk about something else. I fear, dear friend, said Toad with a sad smile, that talk can do little in a case like this. Or doctors either, for that matter. Still, one must grasp at the slightest straw. And, by the way, while you are about it, I hate to give you additional trouble, but I happen to remember that you will pass the door. Would you mind at the same time asking the lawyer to step up? It would be a convenience to me, and there are moments, perhaps I should say there is a moment, when one must face disagreeable tasks, at whatever cost to exhausted nature. A lawyer? Oh, he must be really bad, the affrighted rat said to himself as he hurried from the room, not forgetting, however, to lock the door carefully behind him. Outside he stopped to consider. The other two were far away, and he had no one to consult. It's best to be on the safe side, he said on reflection. I've known Toad fancy himself frightfully bad before, without the slightest reason. But I've never heard him ask for a lawyer. If there's nothing really the matter, the doctor will tell him he's an old ass and cheer him up, and that will be something gained. I'd better humor him and go. It won't take very long. So he ran off to the village on his errand of mercy. The toad, who had hopped lightly out of bed as soon as he heard the key turned in the lock, watched him eagerly from the window till he disappeared down the carriage drive. Then, laughing heartily, he dressed as quickly as possible in the smartest suit he could lay hands on at the moment, filled his pockets with cash which he took from a small drawer in the dressing table, and next, knotting the sheets from his bed together and tying one end of the improvised rope round the central mullion of the handsome Tudor window which formed such a feature of his bedroom, he scrambled out, slid lightly to the ground, and taking the opposite direction to the rat, marched off light-heartedly, whistling a merry tune. It was a gloomy luncheon for Rat when the badger and the mole at length returned, and he had to face them at table with his pitiful and unconvincing story. The badger's caustic, not to say brutal, remarks may be imagined and therefore passed over, but it was painful to the rat that even the mole, though he took his friend's side as far as possible, could not help saying, "'You've been a bit of a duffer this time, Ratty. Toad, too, of all animals!' "'He did it awfully well,' said the crestfallen rat. "'He did you awfully well,' rejoined the badger hotly. "'However, talking won't mend matters.' He's got clear away for the time, that's certain. And the worst of it is, he'll be so conceited with what he'll think is his cleverness that he may commit any folly. One comfort is, we're free now, and needn't waste any more of our precious time doing century go. But we'd better continue to sleep at Toad Hall for a while longer. Toad may be brought back at any moment, on a stretcher or between two policemen. So spoke the badger not knowing what the future held in store, or how much water, and of how turbid a character, was to run under bridges before Toad should sit at ease again in his ancestral hall.
Meanwhile, Toad, gay and irresponsible, was walking briskly along the high road, some miles from home. At first he had taken by-paths and crossed many fields and changed his course several times in case of pursuit. But now, feeling by this time safe from recapture, and the sun smiling brightly on him, and all nature joining in a chorus of approval to the song of self-praise that his own heart was singing to him, he almost danced along the road in his satisfaction and conceit. "'Smart piece of work, that,' he remarked to himself, chuckling. "'Brain against brute force, and brain came out on the top, as it's bound to do. <laughs> "'Poor old Ratty, my, won't he catch it when the badger gets back. "'A worthy fellow, Ratty, with many good qualities, but very little intelligence, and absolutely no education. "'I must take him in hand some day and see if I can make something out of him.' Filled full of conceited thoughts such as these, he strode along, his head in the air, till he reached a little town, where the sign of the Red Lion, swinging across the road halfway down the main street, reminded him that he had not breakfasted that day, and that he was exceedingly hungry after his long walk. He marched into the inn, ordered the best luncheon that could be provided at so short a notice, and sat down to eat it in the coffee room. He was about halfway through his meal when an only too familiar sound, approaching down the street, made him start and fall a-trembling all over. The poop-poop drew nearer and nearer. The car could be heard to turn into the inn-yard and come to a stop, and Toad had to hold on to the leg of the table to conceal his overmastering emotion. Presently the party entered the coffee-room, hungry, talkative, and gay, voluble on their experiences of the morning and the merits of the chariot that had brought them along so well. Toad listened eagerly, all ears for a time. At last he could stand it no longer. He slipped out of the room quietly, paid his bill at the bar, and as soon as he got outside sauntered round quietly to the inn-yard. "'There cannot be any harm,' he said to himself. "'Am I only just looking at it?' The car stood in the middle of the yard, quite unattended, the stable helps and other hangers-on being all at their dinner. Toad walked slowly round it, inspecting, criticizing, musing deeply. "'I wonder,' he said to himself presently, "'I wonder if this sort of car starts easily.' Next moment, hardly knowing how it came about, he found he had hold of the handle and was turning it. As the familiar sound broke forth, the old passion seized on Toad and completely mastered him, body and soul. As if in a dream he found himself, somehow, seated in the driver's seat. As if in a dream he pulled the lever and swung the car round the yard and out through the archway, and, as if in a dream, all sense of right and wrong, all fear of obvious consequences, seemed temporarily suspended. He increased his pace, and as the car devoured the street and leapt forth on the high road through the open country, he was only conscious that he was towed once more, towed at his best and highest, towed the terror, the traffic queller, the lord of the lone trail, before whom all must give way or be smitten into nothingness and everlasting night. He chanted as he flew, and the car responded with sonorous drone. The miles were eaten up under him as he sped he knew not whither, fulfilling his instincts, living his hour, reckless of what might come to him. "'To my mind,' observed the chairman of the bench of magistrates cheerfully, "'the only difficulty that presents itself in this otherwise very clear case is "'how we can possibly make it sufficiently hot for the incorrigible rogue and hardened ruffian "'whom we see cowering in the dock before us. "'Let me see. "'He has been found guilty, on the clearest evidence, first, "'of stealing a valuable motor-car, secondly, of driving to the public danger, and, thirdly, of gross impertinence to the rural police. Uh, Mr. Clerk, will you tell us, please, what is the very stiffest penalty we can impose for each of these offences, without, of course, giving the prisoner the benefit of any doubt, because there isn't any. The clerk scratched his nose with his pen. Some people would consider, he observed, that stealing the motor-car was the worst offence, and so it is. But cheeking the police undoubtedly carries the severest penalty, and so it ought. 
Supposing you were to say 12 months for the theft, which is mild, and three years for the furious driving, which is lenient, and 15 years for the cheek, which was pretty bad sort of cheek, judging by what we've heard from the witness box, even if you only believe one-tenth part of what you heard, and I never believe more myself, those figures, if added correctly, tot up to 19 years. First rate, said the chairman. So you'd better make it around 20 years and be on the safe side, concluded the clerk. An excellent suggestion, said the chairman approvingly. Prisoner, pull yourself together and try and stand up straight. It's going to be 20 years for you this time. And mind, if you appear before us again upon any charge whatever, we shall have to deal with you very seriously. Then the brutal minions of the law fell upon the hapless toad, loaded him with chains and dragged him from the courthouse, shrieking, praying, protesting, across the marketplace where the playful populace, always as severe upon detected crime as they are sympathetic and helpful when one is merely wanted, assailed him with jeers, carrots, and popular catchwords, past hooting school children, their innocent faces lit up with the pleasure they ever derive from the sight of a gentleman in difficulties, across the hollow-sounding drawbridge, below the spiky portcullis, under the frowning archway of the grim old castle, whose ancient towers soared high overhead, past guardrooms full of grinning soldiery off duty, past sentries who coughed in a horrid, sarcastic way, because that is as much as a sentry on his post dare do to show his contempt and abhorrence of crime. Up time-worn winding stairs, past men-at-arms in casket and corselet of steel, darting threatening looks through their vizards, across courtyards where mastiffs strained at their leash and pawed the air to get at him, past ancient warders, their halberds leant against the wall, dozing over a pasty and a flagon of brown ale, on and on, past the rack chamber and the thumbscrew room, past the turning that led to the private scaffold, till they reached the door of the grimmest dungeon that lay in the heart of the innermost keep. There at last they paused, where an ancient gowler sat fingering a bunch of mighty keys. "'Odds bodikins,' said the sergeant of police, taking off his helmet and wiping his forehead. "'Rouse thee, old loon, and take over from us this vile toad, a criminal of deepest guilt and matchless artfulness and resource. Watch him and ward him with all thy skill, and mark thee well, greybeard, should aught untoward befall, thy old head shall answer for this, and a moraine on both of them.' The gowler nodded grimly, laying his withered hand on the shoulder of the miserable toad. The rusty key creaked in the lock, the great door clanged behind them, and toad was a helpless prisoner in the remotest dungeon of the best-guarded keep of the stoutest castle in all the length and breadth of merry England. End of chapter 6「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on January 22, 2006. The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham. Chapter 7. The Piper at the Gates of Dawn. The willow wren was twittering his thin little song, hidden himself in the dark selvage of the river bank. Though it was past ten o'clock at night, the sky still clung to and retained some lingering skirts of light from the departed day, and the sullen heats of the torrid afternoon broke up and rolled away at the dispersing touch of the cool fingers of the short midsummer night. Mole lay stretched on the bank still panting from the stress of the fierce day that had been cloudless from dawn till late sunset, and waited for his friend to return. He had been on the river with some companions, leaving the water-rat free to keep an engagement of long standing with Otter, and he had come back to find the house dark and deserted, and no sign of Rat, who was doubtless keeping it up late with his old comrade. It was still too hot to think of staying indoors, so he lay on some cool dock leaves, and, 
thought over the past day and its doings, and how very good they had all been. The rat's light footfall was presently heard coming over the parched grass. Oh, the blessed coolness, he said, and sat down, gazing thoughtfully into the river, silent and preoccupied. You stayed to supper, of course, said Mole presently. Simply had to, said the rat. They wouldn't hear of my going before. You know how kind they always are. And they made things as jolly for me as ever they could, right up until the moment I left. But I felt a brute all the time, as it was clear to me that they were very unhappy, though they tried to hide it. Mole, I'm afraid they're in trouble. Little Portly is missing again, and you know what a lot his father thinks of him, though he never says much about it. What? That child? said Mole lightly. Well, suppose he is. Why worry about it? He's always straying off and getting lost and turning up again. He's so adventurous. But no harm ever happens to him. Everybody hereabouts knows him and likes him just as they do old Otter. And you may be sure some animal or other will come across him and bring him back again all right. Why, we've found him ourselves, miles from home and still quite self-possessed and cheerful. Yes, but this time it's more serious, said the Rat gravely. He's been missing for some days now, and the otters have hunted everywhere, high and low, without finding the slightest trace. And they've asked about every animal, too, for miles around, and no one knows anything about him. Otter's evidently more anxious than he'll admit. I got out of him that young Portly hasn't learned to swim very well yet. I can see he's thinking of the weir. There's a lot of water coming down still, considering the time of year. And the place always had a fascination for the child. And then there are, well, traps and things, you know. Otter's not the fellow to be nervous about any son of his before it's time. And now he is nervous. When I left, he came out with me. He said he wanted some air, and talking about and stretching his legs, I could see that it wasn't that. So I drew him out and pumped him and got it all from him at last. He's going to spend the night watching by the ford. You know the place where the old ford used to be in bygone days before they built the bridge? I know it well, said the Mole. But why should Otter choose to watch there? Well, it seems it was there he gave Portly his first swimming lesson continued the rat, from that shallow, gravelly spit near the bank, and there it was he used to teach him fishing. There young Portly caught his first fish, which he was so very proud the child loved the spot, and Otter thinks that if he came wandering back from wherever he is, if he is anywhere by this time, poor little chap, he might make for the ford he was so fond of, or if he came across it he'd remember it well, and stop there and play, perhaps, so Otter goes there every night and watches, on the chance, you know, just on the chance. They were silent for a time, both thinking the same thing, the lonely, heart-sore animal crouched by the ford, watching and waiting the long night through, on the chance. Well, well, said Rat presently, I suppose we ought to be thinking about turning in but he never offered to move. Rat, said the Mole, I simply can't go and turn in and go to sleep and do nothing, even though there doesn't seem to be anything to be done. We'll get the boat out. We'll paddle upstream. The moon will be up in an hour or so, and we'll search as well as we can. Anyhow, it will be better than just going to bed and doing nothing. Just what I was thinking of myself, said the Rat. It's not the sort of night for bed, anyhow, and daybreak is not so very far off. And then we might pick up some news from him as early risers as we go along. They got the boat out, and Rat took the skulls, paddling with caution. Out in midstream there was a clear, narrow track that faintly reflected the sky. But wherever shadows fell on the water, from bank, bush, or tree, they were as solid to all appearance as the banks themselves, and the mole had to steer with judgment accordingly. Dark and deserted as it was, the night was full of small noises, song and chatter and rustling, telling of the busy little population that were up and about, plying their trades and vocations through the night, till sunshine should fall on them at last and send them off to their well-earned repose. The water's own noises, too, were more apparent than by day. 
its gurglings and croups more unexpected than near at hand, and constantly they started at what seemed a sudden clear call from an actual articulate voice. The line of the horizon was clear and hard against the sky, and in one particular quarter it showed black against a silvery climbing phosphorescence that grew and grew, and at last, over the rim of the waiting earth, the moon lifted with slow majesty, till it swung clear of the horizon, rode off free of moorings, and once again they began to see surfaces, meadows widespread and quiet gardens, and the river itself from bank to bank all softly disclosed, all washed clean of mystery and terror, all radiant again as by day, but with a difference that was tremendous. Their old haunts greeted them again in other raiment, as though they had slipped away and put on this pure new apparel and come quietly back, smiling as they shyly waited to see if they would be recognized again under it. Fastening their boat to a willow, the friends landed in this silent silver kingdom and patiently explored the hedges, the hollow trees, the runnels and their little culverts, the ditches and dry waterways, embarking again and crossing over. They worked their way up the stream in this manner, while the moon, serene and detached in a cloudless sky, did what she could, though so far off, to help them in their quest. Till her hour came, and she sank earthward reluctantly, and left them, and mystery once more held field and river. Then a change began slowly to declare itself. The horizon became clearer, field and tree again more came into sight, and somehow, with a different look, the mystery began to drop away from them. A bird piped suddenly, and was still. A light breeze sprang up and set the reeds and bulrushes rustling. Rat, who was in the stern of the boat while Mole Skulled, sat up suddenly, and listened with a passionate intentness. Mole, who with gentle strokes was just keeping the boat moving, while he scanned the banks with care, looked at him with curiosity. "'It's gone,' sighed the rat, sinking back to his seat again. "'So beautiful and strange and new. Since it was to end so soon, I almost wish I had never heard it for it has roused a longing in me that is pain, and nothing seems worth while but just to hear that sound once more and go on listening to it forever. No, there it is again, he cried, alert once more. Entranced, he was silent for a long space, spellbound. Now it passes on and I begin to lose it, he said presently. Oh, Mole, the beauty of it, the merry bubble and joy, the thin, clear, happy call of the distant piping, such music I never dreamed of. And the call in it is stronger even than the music is sweet. Row on, Mole, row, for the music and the call must be for us. The Mole, greatly wondering, obeyed. I hear nothing myself, he said, but the wind playing in the reeds and rushes and osiers. The rat never answered, if indeed he heard. Wrapped, transported, trembling, he was possessed in all his senses by this new divine thing that caught up his helpless soul and swung and dandled it, a powerless but happy infant in a strong, sustaining grasp. In silence Mole rode steadily, and soon they came to a point where the river divided, a long backwater branching off to one side. With a slight movement of his head, Rat, who had long dropped the rudder lines, directed the rower to take the backwater. The creeping tide of light gained and gained, and now they could see the color of the flowers that gemmed the water's edge. Clearer and nearer still, cried Rat joyously. Now you must surely hear it. Ah, at last, I see you do. Breathless and transfixed, 
the mole stopped rowing as the liquid run of that glad piping broke on him like a wave, caught him up, and possessed him utterly. He saw the tears on his comrade's cheeks and bowed his head and understood. For a space they hung there, brushed by the purple loosestrife that fringed the bank. Then the clear, imperious summons that marched hand in hand with the intoxicating melody imposed its will on Mole, and mechanically he bent to his oars again, and the light grew steadily stronger. But no birds sang as they were wont to do at the approach of dawn, and but for the heavenly music all was marvelously still. On either side of them, as they glided onwards, the rich meadow grass seemed that morning of a freshness and a greenness unsurpassable. Never had they noticed the roses so vivid, the willow herbs so riotous, the meadow sweet so odorous and pervading. Then the murmur of the approaching weir began to hold the air, and they felt a consciousness that they were nearing the end, whatever it might be that surely awaited their expedition. A wide half-circle of foam and glinting lights and shining shoulders of green water, the great weir closed the backwater from bank to bank, troubled all the quiet surface with swirling eddies and floating foam streaks, and deadened all the other sounds within its solemn and soothing rumble. In midmost of the stream, embraced in the weir's shimmering arm spread, a small island lay anchored, fringed close with willow and silver birch and alder, reserved, shy, but full of significance. It hid whatever it might hold behind a veil, keeping it till the hour should come, and, with the hour, those who were called and chosen. Slowly, but with no doubt or hesitation whatever, and in something of a solemn expectancy, the two animals passed through the broken, tumultuous water and moored their boat at the flowery margin of the island. In silence they landed, and pushed through the blossom and scented herbage and undergrowth that led up to the level ground, till they stood on a little lawn of a marvellous green, set round with nature's own orchard-trees, crab-apple, wild cherry, and sloe. This is the place of my song-dream, the place the music played to me, whispered Rat, as if in a trance. Here is the holy place. Here, if anywhere, surely we shall find him. Then suddenly the mole felt a great awe fall upon him, an awe that turned his muscles to water, bowed his head and rooted his feet to the ground. It was no panic terror. Indeed, he felt wonderfully at peace and happy, but it was an awe that smote and held him. And without seeing, he knew that it could only mean that some august presence was very, very near. With difficulty he turned to look for his friend, and saw him at his side, cowed, stricken and trembling violently, and still there was utter silence in the populous bird-haunted branches around them, and still the light grew and grew. Perhaps he would never have dared to raise his eyes, but that, though the piping was now hushed, the call and the summons seemed still dominant and imperious. He might not refuse, were death itself waiting to strike him instantly. Once he had looked with mortal eye on things rightly kept hidden. Trembling he obeyed, and raised his humble head. And then, in that utter clearness of the imminent dawn, while nature, flushed with the fullness of incredible color, seemed to hold her breath for the event, he looked in the very eyes of the friend and helper, saw the backward sweep of the curved horns gleaming in the growing daylight, saw the stern hooked nose between the kindly eyes that were 
looking down on him humorously, while the bearded mouth broke into a half-smile at the corners, saw the rippling muscles of the arm that lay across the broad chest, the long, supple hand, still holding the pan-pipes only just fallen away from the parted lips, saw the splendid curves of the shaggy limbs disposed in majestic ease on the sward, saw, last of all, nestling between his very hooves, sleeping soundly in entire peace and contentment, the little, round, podgy, childish form of the baby otter. All this he saw for one moment, breathless and intense, vivid on the morning sky, and still, as he looked, he lived, and still as he lived, he wondered. Rat, he found breath to whisper, shaking, are you afraid? Afraid, murmured the rat his eyes shining with unutterable love. Afraid of him? Oh, never! And yet, and yet, oh, Mole, I am afraid! Then the two animals, crouching to the earth, bowed their heads and did worship. Sudden and magnificent, the sun's broad golden disk showed itself over the horizon facing them and the first full rays shooting across the level water meadows took the animals full in the eyes and dazzled them. When they were able to look once more, the vision had vanished, and the air was full of the carol of birds that hailed the dawn. As they stared blankly in dumb misery deepening, as they slowly realized all they had seen and all they had lost, a capricious little breeze, dancing up from the surface of the water, tossed the aspens, shook the dewy roses, and blew lightly and caressingly on their faces. And with its soft touch came instant oblivion. For this was the last best gift that the kindly demigod is careful to bestow on those to whom he has revealed himself in their helping. The gift of forgetfulness, lest the awful remembrance should remain and grow and overshadow mirth and pleasure, and the great haunting memory should spoil all the afterlives of the little animals helped out of difficulties, in order that they should be happy and light-hearted as before. Mole rubbed his eyes and stared at Rat, who was looking about him in a puzzled sort of way. "'I beg your pardon.' "'What did you say, Rat?' he asked. "'I think I was only remarking,' said Rat slowly, "'that this was the right sort of place, "'and that here, if anywhere, we should find him. "'And, and look, why, there he is, the little fellow!' "'And with a cry of delight he ran toward the slumbering portly. "'But Mole stood still a moment, held in thought as one wakens suddenly from a beautiful dream who struggles to recall it and can recapture nothing but a dim sense of the beauty of it, the beauty, till that too fades away in its turn and the dreamer bitterly accepts the hard, cold waking and all its penalties. So Mole, after struggling with his memory for a brief space, shook his head sadly and followed Rat. Portly woke up with a joyous squeak, and wriggled with pleasure at the sight of his father's friends, who had played with him so often in past days. In a moment, however, his face grew blank, and he fell to hunting round in a circle with a pleading whine, as a child that has fallen happily asleep in its nurse's arms and wakes to find itself alone and laid in a strange place, and searches the corners and cupboards, and runs from room to room, despair growing silently in its heart. Even so, Portly searched the island, and searched, dogged and unwearying, till at last the black moment came for giving it up, and sitting down, and crying bitterly. The mole ran quickly to comfort the little animal, but Rat, lingering, 
looked long and doubtfully at certain hoof-marks deep in the sward. Some great animal has been here, he murmured slowly and thoughtfully, and stood musing, musing, his mind strangely stirred. "'Come along, Rat,' called Mole. "'Think of poor Otter waiting up there by the ford.' Portly had soon been comforted by the promise of a treat, a jaunt on the river in Mr. Rat's real boat, and the two animals conducted him to the water's side, placed him securely between them in the bottom of the boat, and paddled off down the backwater. The sun was fully up by now, and hot on them. Birds sang lustily and without restraint and flowers smiled and nodded from either bank, but somehow, so thought the animals, with less of richness and blaze of color than they seemed to remember seeing quite recently somewhere, they wondered where. The main river reached again, they turned the boat's head upstream toward the river where they knew their friend was keeping his lonely vigil. As they drew near the familiar ford, the mole took the boat into the bank, and they lifted Portly out, and set him on his legs on the towpath, and gave him his marching orders and a friendly farewell pat on the back, and shoved out into midstream. They watched the little animal as he waddled along the path contentedly, and with importance, watched him till they saw his muzzle suddenly lift and his waddle break into a clumsy amble, and he quickened his pace with shrill whines and wriggles of recognition. Looking up the river, they could see Otter start up, tense and rigid, from the shallows where he crouched in dumb patience, and could hear his amazed and joyous bark as he bounded up through the osiers onto the path. Then the mole, with a strong pull on the oar, swung the boat round and let the full stream bear them down again whither it would their quest now happily ended. "'I feel strangely tired, Rat,' said the Mole, leaning wearily over his oars as the boat drifted. "'It's being up all night, you'll say, perhaps, but that's nothing. We do as much half the nights of the week as this time of the year. No, I feel as if I had just been through something very exciting and rather terrible. And it was just over, and yet nothing in particular has happened. Or something very surprising and splendid and beautiful, murmured the Rat, leaning back and closing his eyes. I feel just as you do, Mole, simply dead tired, though not body tired. It's lucky we've got the stream with us to take us home. Isn't it jolly to feel the sun again soaking into one's bones? and hear the wind playing in the reeds. It's like music, far away music, said the Mole, nodding drowsily. So I was thinking, murmured the Rat, dreamful and languid, dance music, the lilting sort that runs on without a stop, but with words in it too. It passes into words and out of them again. I catch them at intervals. Then it is dance music once more, and then nothing but the reeds soft whispering. You hear better than I, said the Mole sadly. I cannot catch the words. Let me try and give you them, said the Rat softly, his eyes still closed. Now it is turning into words again, faint but clear, lest the awe should dwell and turn your frolic to fret, you shall look on my power at the helping hour, but then you shall forget. Now the reeds take it up, forget, forget, they sigh, and it dies away in a rustle and a whisper, and the voice returns. Lest limbs be reddened and rent, I spring the trap that is set. As I loose the snare, you may glimpse me there, for surely you shall forget. Row nearer, Mole, nearer the reeds. It's hard to catch and grows each minute fainter. Helper and healer, I cheer. 
Small waifs in the woodland wet, Strays I find in it, Wounds I bind in it, Bidding them all forget, Nearer, Mole, nearer! No, that is no good, The song has died away into reed talk. But what do the words mean? Asked the wondering Mole. That I do not know, said the Rat simply. I passed them on to you as they reached me, and, ah, now they return again, and this time full and clear, this time at last it is the real, the unmistakable thing, simple, passionate, perfect. Well, let's have it, then, the Mole said, after he had waited patiently for a few minutes, half dozing in the hot sun. But no answer came. He looked and understood the silence. With a smile of much happiness on his face, and something of a listening look still lingering there, the weary rat was fast asleep. So ends Chapter 7, The Piper at the Gates of Dawn.